All right, welcome. Uh, this is Jason with Illinois Learn to Hunt. I'm here with my fellow instructor, Curtis. Curtis, you want to say hi real fast? Hi, Curtis here. Curtis, and we are here today with uh, Holly Tutton, who is a um, tick researcher, and her title right now is a vector ecologist from the Medical um, Entomology Lab at Illinois Natural History Survey. Um, so Holly, welcome. Hi. <laughs> and hi. Um, so um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you get first, how did you get studying ticks? Because um, it's, it's kind of an odd thing to study. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to rewind all the way to 2005. <laughs> um, so I was a, a first generation college student, first in family, um, and um, had to uh, work my way through college. So I always had some other type of job along with my studies, whether it was waiting tables or painting houses. Um, and one summer uh, between my junior and senior year, there was an opportunity floating around to conduct field work collecting ticks in North Carolina. Uh, and it didn't pay great, uh, but it paid enough. And I also realized that they were going to pay me to drive all around my home state, which I love doing. Um, and I like the woods. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, my first couple weeks, I got ravaged by mosquitoes. Um, but that summer, I realized that I had an abiding fascination um, with vectors, with ticks and mosquitoes. And it brought me, the work brought me to my first mentor who uh, got me over to Clemson for a graduate program following my degree. Awesome. So um, what research have you been doing recently now? So uh, for the past couple of years uh, at the INHS Medical Entomology Lab, I've been uh, developing a statewide tick surveillance program for Illinois. Okay, so what have you guys uh, been surveilling? What are you looking for exactly? So we have two primary surveillance targets and that's the black-legged tick, which people are more familiar with as the deer tick um, and the Gulf Coast tick. Um, we have an entire suite of criteria for the different habitats where we might find them. And we also use uh, records from the Illinois Department of Public Health indicating where people might have had a tick bite exposure that led to illness. And we go into these areas uh, to look for these species of ticks. And then while we're doing the sampling for them, if we pick up other species of ticks, such as the Lone Star tick or the American dog tick, we also collect those. Okay, so you're just trying to see where they're at in the state at this point? At this point, yeah, we're filling in the map. Um, so there's a publicly available map that I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, and what we're doing is getting to every corner we possibly can, looking for ticks. Uh, we bring them back to the lab, identify them, and then we test them for different uh, disease-causing agents, uh, whether that's bacteria or viruses. Um, and so all of those data we then take and hand, hand over to IDPH and they put it up on publicly available maps of their website. Um, at this point, uh, being a couple years in, we're also uh, beginning um, some new research paths that will cycle back in to inform risk awareness um, for um, hikers, hunters, um, and uh, that's, for instance, understanding how different populations of ticks in the state are related to each other, because that's going to give us a better idea of how they're moving around the state. Um, are they moving short distances or long distances? Um, we're also working with Trent Ford, the Illinois state climatologist, to get a better understanding of how uh, Illinois' climate interacts with vector populations to affect human uh, health risk. Um, but right now our primary objective is getting out, getting as many ticks as we can, filling in that map, testing as many ticks as we can, filling in that map, but then branching off into different arenas that will allow us to uh, develop a more refined understanding of risk in the state. I got to ask about this map. So what, what ticks can we find in what places in Illinois? Okay, so uh, a general summary, um, would basically be, so the black-legged tick, right? That's more commonly known as the deer tick. Um, 
in general, the pattern that seems to be holding for this tick, um, and there's also some outstanding work that's been done by Brian Allen at the University of Illinois Entomology Department. Um, so he's been here a bit longer than us, and he's a close collaborator of our lab. Um, and he's also been looking at black-legged tick populations. And they just, uh, he just had a publication out uh, this month um, where uh, they were predicting how soon the Lyme disease bacterium will follow tick populations as they move into the state. Um, but in general, it seems we've got the black-legged tick coming from the north, so coming from Wisconsin and Michigan down into Illinois and moving down into central Illinois. Um, and then from the south, um, we, we definitely have um, a rapidly advancing front of the Lone Star tick. Um, so they're already up in central Illinois, as, as far north as Kankakee County. Um, we've got American dog ticks all over the state. And then we've got this developing Gulf Coast tick story uh, where it's starting to look like uh, we might have some populations, some established populations in southern Illinois. As to whether they'll move north or not in the coming years, that remains to be seen. So do different species of ticks carry different diseases? Yes. Uh, knowing, you know, if you have been bit by a tick, knowing what species it is can help your doctor significantly. Uh, different species of ticks carry uh, different disease agents, both bacterial and viral. Um, and it's so distinct, it can be so specific to the tick that in our lab, sometimes um, if it's a certain species of tick, we're, we're only testing it for certain disease agents. Um, and then other species we test for different disease agents. And this is all following Centers for Disease Control criteria. Um, and so I think so a critical key message for folks uh, watching this is uh, if, you, if you are bit by a tick, uh, get an identification of that tick. What is it about ticks that make it so specific to the species? Like are some species just resilient to other diseases that they don't pick up or what is it that determines that? That's a really great way to phrase it actually. Um, when we see a close association between any vector and the disease agent that it transmits, that's the result of um, a long history of co coevolutionary arms race. Right, so we think about these vector-borne disease agents and we think about humans or companion animals getting sick, um, but these agents can also have an effect on the health of the vector itself, right? So the vector is also battling this disease agent and this disease agent is doing its best to evade those defenses. Um, so some disease agents make it through the gauntlet and they can survive in the vector and others don't. So I got to uh, just going back to the different types of ticks and where they occur in Illinois. So you talked about like the Lone Star and Gulf Coast, which which seem to be moving north, which kind of fits what we what we think, right? Like climate change moving north. But then we've got these black legged ticks that are moving south. Uh, what's what's pushing that expansion kind of going the opposite way that we'd expect? Right. Um, well, it could be that um, populations were um, kind of uh, pushed out of the area during uh, glaciation um, and uh, pushed into maybe small unglaciated pockets of land. And now that the glaciers have receded, there's just this natural movement back out of those uh, refugia. Um, so they could have populated the area before, you know, glaciers come, they get they get pushed into refugia, then glaciers go away, and then there's just this slow expansion back out of those refugia. Um, uh, and also um, the effects of reforestation. Um, so I think a lot of people familiar with Illinois history um, are familiar with the fact that we tend to have such a strong naturalist community here because it was almost all lost. <laughs> um, and so what we are seeing is we're seeing more reforestation um, and so ticks, uh, more suitable tick habitat is developing across the area. Um, but then also there are other factors such as the loss of top-down predation. Um, so we, uh, we end up uh, 
for instance, having really high small rodent populations, um, and, and those are the reservoir for the disease agent. It's not deer. You know? So for black-legged ticks, for instance, the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, deer clear that bacterium. Um, they're, they're, they're resistant to it. But small mice are actually uh, the reservoir where the Lyme bacterium amplifies. And then ticks bite those small mice, you know, and then they move up the chain to deer through different life stages. Um, but uh, another hypothesis is that we just have less top-down predation, so we have more prolific small rodent populations now. And so uh, that, that consequently leads to more uh, higher, higher incidence of disease agents, and then also a higher deer population. Um, and deer are the reproductive host for black-legged ticks. So females will stay on the deer over the winter. Um, and so more reproductive hosts, more ticks. You know, so there are several intersecting uh, hypotheses as to why we're seeing this. Um, but it's likely the black-legged tick, uh, maybe the simplest way to think of it is a, it's a reinvasion or reestablishment. Um, whereas with the lone star tick, it's likely um, a true invasion. Um, population genetics work that's been done indicates that se there seems to be kind of a bleeding edge uh, going north. Um, and uh, that could very well be because um, winters uh, are getting milder, um, so not quite as harsh for tick survival or overwintering. Um, there's a longer, um, uh, simply just kind of a longer uh, reproductive and breeding season. Um, that the seasons that are um, most conducive to tick activity are becoming longer, so, and, and the temperatures are more conducive, and then higher precipitation leads to more favorable micro, human microclimates where the ticks occur. Sounds like a perfect storm of a uh, scary uh, tick <laughs> in the <America. laughs> um, yeah, you know, this is why we're we're developing uh, these research avenues with Trent, um, I think. And, and then our lab director, Chris Stone, he's working with um, some folks at Illinois Brace. So that's, that's this uh, consortium that's kind of focused on anticipating the effects of climate change. Um, and, you know, and that can be temperatures, that can be weather change, um, you know, that can be things like, that could also uh, affect vectors in many ways. Um, in most scenarios, we're seeing potentially more vectors, uh, more different types of vectors, higher incidence of vector-borne disease agents. But then in other scenarios, such as with snap freezes, um, we could be seeing uh, higher mortality. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex um, climatological and ecological scenario that merits a lot more study. Um, so that we can just basically be prepared with better risk profiles. What is, I mean, a tick is pretty small. So how are they, how fast are they moving into these areas? And what, how are they moving into these areas? Like what, um, I mean, they can't choose really to move to, if it is because they're chasing the, the weather or the temperature, and they're moving up because of that. Like what other animal are they, what's their host animal that's carrying them up here? Yeah. Um, you know, so again, this is going to vary by tick species, but in general, you can think of ticks moving longer distances on large mammal hosts or birds. Um, and so uh, most of the ticks that we're talking about, ticks that pose a risk to human or companion animal health in Illinois, are known as three-host hard ticks. Um, and so basically what that means is they have several different life stages before they become a reproductive adult. And at each one of those life stages, they need a uh, blood meal from a different host. So the female lays eggs, the eggs hatch into larvae. Uh, larvae have to find a host and take a blood meal. And then larvae have to molt into nymphs. So that's still not a reproductive. The nymphs have to take a blood meal. And then the nymphs molt into adults. And then the adults have to find a blood meal. And adults also typically mate on that final host. Um, and so when you do have adults attached for, say, eight days on a host, uh, gathering out the blood that they need for, for mating and for eggs, the host could be moving long distances, right? And then the female drops off the host and lays her eggs. And so these eggs now are going to hatch out in a completely different place than their parent did. Um, but yeah, 
in between those stages, in between being on hosts, you're right. You know, most ticks aren't going to have much lateral movement in the environment. Uh, you know, they tend to, uh, most species, well, the Gulf Coast tick is an exception that we'll talk about in a minute. Most species tend to be tied to fairly humid microclimates. Um, they, one of their greatest constraints in life is, is drying out. Um, and so they're going to spend the majority of their life actually in the soil. <laughs> Um, in, in one respect, you can almost think of ticks as soil dwellers. They face a lot of the same challenges, such as fighting off um, fungus. Um, and so they're going to go down into the duff. So that's that area underneath the leaf litter. Um, and then, you know, they'll, they'll crawl up, you know, for instance, a blade of grass to quest for hosts. And so you know, they're sitting on that blade of grass trying to conserve water. But then maybe there's a vibration, a footfall, and they pick up on that and put their put their forelegs up. Then maybe they pick up, you know, some CO2 and they angle their body on that grass. And then maybe they pick up radiant heat and they're really zeroing in on this animal that's moving towards them so that when it brushes past, they grab on and they crawl up. Um, but so this kind of, then you might have some lateral movement and they crawl down the grass and go, oh, you know, 10 centimeters over from where they were before, you know, if they don't make that good host, if they don't catch on to that host. Um, some ticks are more active than others, though, in that kind of small local vicinity. Um, so black-legged ticks, they'll, they tend to mainly just kind of climb up the vegetation and climb back down again and climb up and climb back down. Um, but Gulf Coast ticks and Lone Star ticks, if they pick up on a host, uh, in, within a reasonable distance, they'll run for you. Um, I've seen them running for me. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've been sat on the forest floor and, and, and seen them coming up out of the leaf litter and, and coming over. They're not just hanging out on, on a piece of grass waiting for me to pass. Um, you know, even if you're on um, mowed grass near the forest edge, they'll venture out of the forest edge. If, if they zero in on a host, they will come out. And that's one reason why in our surveillance, um, we always use cloth drags. You know, we, we pull white flannel cloth along the, the forest floor or the trail side to pick up those ticks that are on the vegetation. But for Lone Star ticks and Gulf Coast ticks, we also use um, CO2 traps, which sounds way fancier than it is. We just take a big piece of white cloth, put it on the ground, drop some dry ice on it, leave it for a couple hours and come back and ticks will have been attracted to the dry ice. And they're just kind of sitting there with their forelegs in the air, just waiting for something else to happen. And you know what happens is we pick them up and put them in ethanol. Um, but because they kind of have that active hunting, um, they, they, it's a very effective tool for getting them. The main ways that ticks are gonna find basically their meal is gonna be one uh, movement, two, uh, heat and then and three is going to be that CO2. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I would say that that's a generalization, but it's a very useful paradigm for us uh, to think of it uh, in terms of um, risk and, 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 and tick bite prevention. Yes. You know, and so that's why, uh, for instance, uh, you know, if you can, um, walking in the middle of trails helps, right, because you're further away from that vegetation and you're not brushing up against that vegetation, then they don't have a chance to orient towards you. Sure. Well, I think that's a, that's a really good lead in to ask, uh, you know, what, what can hunters, what can hikers, what, what can people do to protect ourselves when we're, when we're out in the scary woods and grass? <laughs> a few things that, um, that, for instance, I use when I'm hiking with my family um, is, uh, starting with just a layer of barrier protection with my clothes. So ticks typically transfer um, at um, thigh level or below. Um, so they're on the vegetation and they're going to transfer there and then they stereotypically crawl up. So if you ever, if, if tick ever transfers and you watch it, you'll see it, it just starts crawling up. So if you create an ascending barrier out of your clothes, just to start. So tuck your pants into your socks, tuck your shirt into your pants, you're not giving them uh, entry. You know, you can imagine if your shirt was untucked and over your pants, if they're crawling up, then they're crawling right up underneath the shirt, right? But if it's tucked in, then they just transfer onto the shirt and keep crawling. 
So you can just make a physical barrier. Um, I, um, I use permethrin spray. Um, and so you can get clothes that are pre-treated with permethrin, um, or you can treat your own clothes with permethrin. Um, and uh, a couple caveats to it are uh, wet permethrin is super toxic to cats. Uh, so it's just something I always really like to point out. It's on the warning label. Read the warning label very, very carefully. Um, and uh, it's commonly available. The sprays are available, for instance, at Farm and Fleet um, or Lowe's or Home Depot, uh, any, of, any, any stores that, that would be affiliated with outdoor work um, or recreation. Um, so I treat our clothes with permethrin. Um, and permethrin gives ticks a uh, condition known as hot foot. Um, so, um, it actually kind of shocks the nerves of the ticks. It's a chemical kind of shock to the nerves. Um, so when they transfer onto clothing that's been treated with permethrin, you can watch them. They'll, they'll crawl for a second and then they kind of, and then they just fall off backwards. Um, they just can't maintain contact anymore. Um, and, uh, then we also use DEET, um, on top of that. So we'll, we'll spray, um, spray with DEET according to the label instructions. And again, uh, you know, DEET, I think everybody knows you can get it at your grocery store. Um, and so for me, for my family, um, for when we're doing recreation outdoor, that's, that's, my, that's my base right there, is these ascending barriers, Promethean treated clothes, and DEET. Um, and then also when you're outside, you know, you can enact behavioral preventatives. Um, so for instance, there's the fact that, you know, when ticks transfer off vegetation, uh, they're going to transfer off probably on your legs, you know, sometimes maybe on the waist and chest, but, and then always crawl up. And so when I'm out, uh, when we're collecting ticks for the program or when I'm out, uh, for, uh, for fun, um, I'm just kind of, you know, glancing down as I'm walking, you know, just, just kind of look down and just scan up, uh, from the, from the feet to the chest. Um, I tend to be pretty paranoid about it. I do it about every 10 meters or so. Um, and, and then also wearing light clothing. Now I know that's not always going to be an option. Um, but I found that, uh, when you have kind of a regularly patterned clothing, this kind of solid colored tick will usually stand out, um, especially if it's moving. Um, but just doing that regular visual scan of the body, starting at the bottom, visually scanning up, visually scanning back down again. Um, to catch any ticks that might be on the move. Um, staying to the middle of trails, so, or even when you're in the woods, you know, when you're kind of in a nice open uh, wood with, with very little uh, mid-story, um, if you're not brushing up against vegetation, you're not giving ticks much opportunity to transfer. Um, one exception to this, the Lone Star tick can just hang out under leaf litter, and they can, they can just kind of crawl up on your boots. Um, but, you know, if you've got repellents on, they're not going to, they're typically not going to make it far past your boots. Um, so just kind of not brushing up against vegetation. If you're walking on a trail, stay in the middle of the trail, uh, regularly do a visual scan for ticks and uh, use repellents. <clears throat> what about on our, on our canine companions that are out there with us? Can we use the the same things. And then just to back up about the permethrin, is it okay to have around cats once it's dry? Okay. Um, so this is where we uh, encounter the fact that I'm not a veterinarian. Um, and so I just, I simply can't give advice about things like that. I don't have a dog. You know, I can, I can, I can kind of say, personally, this is what I do when, when I'm out hiking with my family, but I can't speak to to what I would do for a dog. Um, and so what I would recommend uh, is, uh, and, and things like it being toxic to cats, uh, you know, I just read that on the label, right? Um, that's, that's not my professional knowledge, that's just my personal experience. Um, so what I would recommend is that um, I, can, um, I can direct you to somebody who give you more concrete information on that if you wanted, and you might be able to do some follow-up questions with her Sure. Uh, so uh, what should someone do if they find a tick crawling on them and also if it, if it bites them? Uh, oh, one other, 
one other uh, thing I use when I'm out personally hiking is I'll attach strips of duct tape or masking tape to my pants. Um, and then for instance, if so, for instance, um, sometimes when you encounter larvae, lone star larvae, you don't just encounter one, uh, you'll encounter a lot. You know, it kind of looks like this wriggling red dust on your pants, um, but it's all in one place because they transfer as a very small patch onto your pants. Um, and uh, it can be very easy to just kind of rip off a strip of that tape, slap it on the ticks, and just fold it over and, you know, throw it away. Uh, keep it in a Ziploc bag in your pack and, and throw it away when you're out of the woods. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if, if, if you don't want to touch a tick that's crawling on you, um, you know, you can take a piece of tape and just slap it on that tick um, to get rid of it. Um, you know, me personally, um, obviously, if... Uh, if, if it's something that I think is, is novel or interesting, I'll collect it. Um, you know, there have been times, you know, when I'm out hiking and, and I look at it and I say, oh yeah, you know, that's a Lone Star female and I know they're all over the place and I really don't care and I'll just kind of swipe it off my pants with my hand. Um, if somebody has a loose tick crawling on them and they're interested in knowing what it is, um, you know, they can take a picture of it uh, they can upload it to iNaturalist. Um, they can uh, send a picture to the Tick Encounter Resource Center, uh, which is a, a quick uh, internet search engine uh, search away. If you just type in Tick Encounter Resource Center, you can send them a photo and get an ID. Um, it helps if you uh, have it on a lighter background and some of the, the details of the tick stand out. Um, they can also um, if they want, they can, if they really are keen to know, for instance, what, what the species of tick is, uh, for instance, maybe they're on their own property uh, and it's just a loose tick that hasn't bit them. Um, we have instructions at our lab's website where people can uh, send in a tick for a free identification. Um, but I, I don't, I discourage people from sending in ticks that are attached uh, because, um, we don't have the means to return those ticks if they're needed later. Um, and so if somebody has an attached tick, um, I think there's a kind of a very different uh, progression um, for, for what they can, what, what I, I, I would personally do. So basically if I had an attached tick, what I would personally do is I would uh, remove it um, according to instructions that are easily found at the website of the CDC or the Illinois Department of Public Health. So if you do a web search for safely remove attached tick, um, there are lots of informative videos, there are lots of instructions to use. Um, I would um, get a picture of it. So again, at this point, it was an attached tick. You know, ticks aren't gonna fly, they're not gonna jump, um, they are very slow crawlers, uh, typically. Um, so, but if you are worried about that, um, after removing it, you can pop it in a Ziploc bag. You can just, you know, remove it, put it in a Ziploc bag, seal that up, um, write who it was from, um, where you think you got the tick, the day, just some basic information uh, that could help later, and you can just put it in the freezer, and that will kill it. You know, and then once the tick is killed and the ick factor is gone, um, you can get it out of the freezer, put it on a white sheet of paper, get a picture, upload that picture to iNaturalist, send it to the Tick Encounter Resource Center, or uh, there are several other photo-based um, tick identification apps. So you can upload the picture there um, and get a species ID of the tick. Because knowing whether it's a black-legged tick or an American dog tick or a Lone Star tick or a Gulf Coast tick is uh, potentially gonna help if you end up uh, developing any symptoms and have to consult a doctor because different tick species are associated with different disease agents. So getting an identification, if, 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 if I was bit by a tick, the very first thing that I would want is a safe removal and an identification. Um, and then, um, CDC, their website, they say, you know, you can save the tick, you can flush it down the toilet. What I personally do is I save the tick. Uh, so once I've got that ID, um, I just pop it back in my freezer and forget about it. And, and that's why it's so important, you know, that you do write down those details about, you know, have you traveled outside the county in the past 10 days? You know, what date did you find this tick? Where do you think that you got it? 
uh, any other important details, because then, you know, once it's in the freezer, you don't forget, you know, if you don't label the bags, if you don't put any kind of information, then you potentially end up having like 10 bags in the freezer and you're going, oh, I don't know which one it is that we're talking about. Um, but I just, I, I, I put it in my freezer and I put it in a little Tupperware and forget about it. Um, and uh, then, you know, uh, if, if there are any concerning symptoms that end up leading to a physician's visit, um, that tick is still in your possession. Um, and there, uh, at that point, you know, it would be something to be determined between you and your, your physician, but you would still have it. Do you know on average how long it takes for symptoms to pop up uh, from after getting a tick bite? So what I can say is that there's a ton of information about that at CDC and IDPH, but I really can't speak to those kinds of things. You know, again, like what I can say is what this is what I personally do um, if, I, if I find an attached tick, but I'm not a physician. Um, so I, I really can't provide medical advice about that. Um, but um, there's a lot of, there's a wealth of information about that um, online. Additionally, Illinois has a really fantastic uh, tick-borne disease advocacy group. Um, so the Illinois Lyme Association has a Facebook page, um, a website. Do you have any additional uh, recommendations or um, suggestions for hunters specifically when it comes to uh, possibly handling game or transporting game? Uh, or just anything else you'd like hunters to know about ticks? And so, you know, on my end, what I have the experience with is being out in the tick-filled environment and preventing tick bites. Um, and so kind of going back over the things that I said earlier about using repellents and clothing and behavior, in addition to that, um, when you return home, um, there's a solid evidence that taking a shower uh, within a couple hours of returning home uh, can also reduce the risk of tick bite. Um, and that's because some ticks don't uh, bite immediately. You know, maybe they, they crawled up your barriers and somehow managed to pass your repellent and they got in your collar and they got down underneath. Um, but they might spend a little while trying to find the perfect spot. Um, and so taking that shower could wash them off before they ever actually bite. Um, so what I do when I come home, um, I undress um, right beside the washer. Um, and if that's not a possibility, for instance, if I'm camping, I put my clothes in a, a plastic bag, uh, like a plastic garbage bag. Um, you know, for instance, I wouldn't take my clothes off in my tent. Um, so I would take my clothes off into a plastic bag and leave it outside. Um, or if I'm coming home, I'm going to take my clothes off right next to the washer. Um, and or the dryer. Um, what's really required is heat. So water uh, doesn't kill ticks, heat kills ticks. Um, so, you know, high heat in the dryer for 15 minutes or hot wash cycle and then hot dryer. But whatever it is, I'm going to take my clothes off right there and I'm going to expose them to high temperatures to kill any ticks that might be on the clothes. Then I'm going to go take a shower. And then when I get out of the shower, I'm going to do a thorough tick check. And a tick check can be done visually, it can be done with a partner, it can also be done by feel. So for instance, areas of my body that I can't necessarily see, I can still run my fingers over them. And since the tick's only attached at one point, I'll feel it uh, kind of flapping up against my finger. Um, and then I can get a closer look at that. So, you know, those are kind of the behavioral interventions that you can do at home. Um, so you're, you're out in the field and you've got behavioral interventions and you're at home and you've got behavioral interventions too. And I'm dumping all this information right now. It, it sounds like a lot, but it's not. And, and also once you're used to the routine of it, you don't even think twice about it anymore. Um, additionally, if you have companion animals, consult with your vet about what you can do to prevent ticks and tick bites on your animals, but that's going to involve tick checks of your animals too. I'm sure like everything, it varies, but do you have an idea of approximately how long, how long is a tick on a person before it finally decides to, to dig in and take a bite? Well, uh, you know, studies have been done on this um, that, that show a varying amount. So from nearly immediate um, to, uh, to, to several hours later, 
Um, and additionally, the attachment time of the tick itself varies. It varies by the life stage of the tick. You know, is it a larva? Is it a nymph? Is it an adult? It varies by the species of tick. Do, do the host at all become affected by a lot of these diseases that the that besides humans, like can deer be impacted by any of these or any other host animals that they have? So again, I'm 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 not a veterinary epidemiologist. Sure. Um, but um, but yeah, sure, yeah, wildlife can most certainly be affected by vector-borne diseases. You know, this is where we kind of come into this one health concept, right? When we're talking about multi-host. Uh, vectors, when we're talking about multi-host pathogens, so we, we've got these kind of tripartite interactions, right? So you've got uh, a vector, um, a wild animal host or domestic um, humans, um, and then the disease agents themselves. Um, this becomes so complex um, that it requires uh, different forms of expertise to gain a picture of the entire situation of what's going on. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt that uh, vector-borne diseases affect wildlife as well, and that occasionally we see spillover events from that too. Do you have any additional facts about ticks that are interesting that most people don't know about ticks at all? Like, is there any weird, fun, fun, fun? trivial facts about ticks? I don't know about fun. <laughs> Creepy. <Maybe laughs> <it'd> be... <laughs> um, <laughs> we, uh, so we might have a new arrival on the scene. Um, it's something that I want people to be thinking about. Um, so there's a recent uh, invasive in the United States, uh, Haemophysalis longicornis, so the Asian longhorn tick. Um, it had made a couple unsuccessful entries before, but in the last few years, people have realized that there are some established populations here. Um, it actually was discovered in a pretty terrifying way. Uh, there, was, there was a woman who had a small hobby farm um, and she was, I think she was shearing her sheep and realized that she was covered in what she was pretty sure were minute larval ticks all over her. <laughs> and she got in her car and drove to the local extension office <laughs> and walked in and said, what is this? <laughs> uh, and fortunately had a very brave and savvy extension officer um, who took samples and, and they realized that this was the Asian longhorn tick, which it's been intercepted a few times by APHIS coming in on livestock, but they didn't think that it had ever made a successful introduction. Um, and so then subsequently everybody started looking more closely in the areas where they suspected it might have spread from, and it turns out that it had spread and it is spreading. Uh, you can get an updated map from USDA indicating where it's at. So I think it's, it's, it's close to us as uh, Ohio and Kentucky now. Um, so it's probably only a matter of time before it shows up here. Um, in its native range, it has been associated with uh, some human diseases. Um, in the United States so far, it has not. Um, so we do see this uh, sometimes when a vector is introduced to an entirely new area. It might not be associated with diseases it was previously associated with. Um, might not be associated with any, it might become associated with new ones. This takes time and focus and surveillance and research to figure out. But the fun fact about this tick is it doesn't require a male to reproduce. So it's something known as parthenogenesis. Um, and so uh, the female can essentially clone herself. So if you thought ticks were awful, they've just gotten more awful um, because now it can clone itself. Now this isn't all ticks, right? It's this one species. But what it does mean is that it's got a, 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 a pretty high potential to establish somewhere that it invades. Um, and then actually that reminds me of one thing that I do wanna bring up that we didn't touch on because this is not a bacterial disease. This is not a viral disease, but this is a disease associated with ticks, particularly Lone Star ticks and the evidence is mounting for black-legged ticks as well. And this is really important to hunters um, because it's an allergy to mammal meat that's elicited by the bite of the Lone Star tick. Um, 
So there's a lot of uh, really uh, great work being done at this point in time by scientific researchers uh, who work with vectors, but also allergists. Um, and uh, this is called alpha-gal allergy or alpha-gal syndrome. Um, and, in, and that's the search phrase that you would use if you wanted to learn more about this. Um, I've, I've personally had family members who have experienced it. Um, and it can be insidious because it can be hard to recognize in a lot of cases. Um, so essentially what happens is uh, the tick will bite you and it's not transmitting a pathogen to our knowledge. It's not transmitting anything. Um, the thought at, at this point is that it might be something in um, the gut of the tick um, that our body is having some type of cross reaction to. Um, but it bites you and then, um, oh, a, a, there's a delayed period after that tick bite um, in which the allergy is developing. Um, so, you know, it could be a couple weeks later. Um, you eat a burger for dinner. Um, and then <laughs> to make it more complex, um, there's a delayed reaction, a delayed allergic reaction, uh, because it takes a while to digest the food, right? So it's not right when it hits your mouth, you know, like people who are allergic to peanuts, right when they're exposed, they have a reaction, right? Um, and then it can be even more complex because it might not cause anaphylaxis immediately. Um, so you could eat that burger and then you're laying in bed five hours later and just have really terrible indigestion and just feel really bad. And you're thinking, oh, you know, maybe that burger wasn't too good. Maybe there's something going on there. But it actually turns out that you've got a really mild allergy to mammal meat. Um, I, I recently helped uh, somebody here in Illinois uh, realize um, that they might just talking to them. I was just telling them about alpha and they went, whoa, you know, this, this sounds kind of weird. Like I've been having really vague nonspecific indigestion for a year and, and I just thought I was getting old. Right. And they ended up uh, going to an allergist because fortunately there is a, a, a human test for this. Um, so they went to an allergist and said, Hey, you know, I think I might have that mammal meat allergy. And the allergist uh, gave them, them a panel and they did. So they test, they do have alpha gal. Um, and so at that point, you know, the only option, and <laughs> this is one reason why I think it really matters. One of the reasons it matters to hunters is at that point, you know, their option really was to, to stop eating mammal meat and mammal products. Um, but then, you know, all these really distressing symptoms were alleviated. Um, there can be hope though, uh, uh, for, for some people, um, they seem to go into an apparent remission. Um, but it's a really serious uh, condition because in some cases it can progress to anaphylaxis, um, you know, which is quite deadly, uh, requires an immediate ER visit or an epinephrine pen. Um, you know, my relatives who have experienced it carried an epinephrine pen with them an epi injector um, that was prescribed by a doctor. So, um, and I think it's important for hunters to understand because, you know, conventionally, a lot of us, I think, uh, who are familiar with the ticks, think of Lone Star ticks as kind of more of a nuisance than anything else. I mean, there are some bacterial uh, disease agents they can transmit, but they, they ehrlichiosis, for instance, which is much more severe in dogs, um, you know, it still seems to occur in about one to 2% of ticks. Um, and so a lot of people tend to think of Lone Star ticks as kind of more of a nuisance thing than anything else. Um, but unfortunately now it, there's a very strong association between the Lone Star tick and this mammal meat allergy. So it is something that I think hunters need to be aware of and need to be thinking of. And again, a reason why getting that species ID of the tick is so critically important if you have been bit. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of good stuff. So even with the the new emerging Asian longhorn cloning bloodsuckers, you're, you're still going out. You, even with these guys out there, you're you're still going out, right? 
Oh man, I'll tell you what, we had a publication uh, last year in the CDC Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal on Heartland virus in Illinois. Um, I don't know if you've come across it, you know, if you want a copy, just email me. Um, and if I bring up anything, you know, that I, I'm either forgetting to connect you or send you information, just email me. Um, I, I, I have two young kids, so I'm just everywhere these days. Um, but um, yeah, you know, so IDPH, they, they approached me and Chris about, so what had happened was uh, there were two human cases um, within a couple months of each other um, in 2018. And so the folks at IDPH approached us and said, you know, well, we've got a pretty good idea of where we think they got bit. Could you go and collect ticks there uh, and test and get the ticks tested, you know, test the ticks for Heartland virus so we can see um, if the ticks have it too. Um, so, it was, you know, pretty basic site investigation, right? And, and you know, so of course we say yes, you can't, <laughs> you can't say no, right? So of course you say yes, but then I'm sitting back and I'm thinking about it and I'm going, oh gosh, okay, so this is a virus. And what that means in terms of testing is normally we would collect ticks into ethanol, you know, and so they just kind of struggle and drown in the ethanol, right? Well, they actually dry out. Um, but for a virus, um, our only options are to kill them in the field um, on dry ice and then maintain that cold chain until the testing can happen. So maintaining a cold chain, you know, we're running up against that with the COVID vaccine right now, right? Maintaining a cold chain is, it, it's a pain. Um, but another option is to just collect them alive, you know, and then you can kill them in the lab. And uh, if I need to, I've got chill tables, I can identify them on a cold table, right? So that we keep that virus intact. And so logistically, uh, it's, it's easier to plan for live collections. Um, but then at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, and, and because it's a virus and they occur at such a low uh, prevalence, I, I know I have to go in to get you know, hundreds, thousands of ticks. If the virus is there, I need a lot of ticks in order to detect the virus. So I'm going, okay, so I've got to go in here and I've got to collect thousands of live ticks and then I've got to transport them. And it's at, an, it's at a site where we, we know uh, it's highly likely that they have heartland, somebody got heartland virus from the ticks there. And heartland virus, you know, when it does affect people, it's, it's pretty horrific. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get into it here. You can read about it online or in the publication, but it, it's pretty horrific. It, when, it, when it causes symptoms in people, it, it requires a it almost always requires a hospital stay and can can often result in death. So I'm thinking, okay, so I've got to go in, I've got to collect ticks alive that could be infected with Heartland virus. I've got to collect thousands of them and I've got to carry them around in my field bag. Uh, I've got to be really, really serious about tick bite prevention here. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there's a point at which I was kind of like, this is, a, you know, from the outside, this is kind of insane. Um, but then at the same time, I was like, but I, I know I'm safe. I know I'm following all the rules. I know that I'm taking the prevention steps that I need to. I know that I'm taking the behavioral interventions that I need to. Um, and uh, so I was able to kind of go in there confidently, not feeling fear about it. And I think, you know, anybody who's, who's actively thinking about their tick bite prevention strategies We'll get to that point where they feel that way. And once you've done it enough, you know, really won't think about it again. It'll become routine. It'll become part of what you do. It'll become part of your hunting strategy. And uh, you, you probably won't think about ticks much anymore because you won't be seeing them as much. Except for on the deer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I feel safe to go in the woods again, utilizing uh, uh, your precaution. I do feel safe. But one last question I got, I don't know if Jason has one, but are there any big myths or misconceptions that you would like to uh, sort of squash? I know one thing I've heard is that certain people are more attractive to ticks than others. Um, is there, have you ever noticed this? Is there any truth to that? Or is that is that one of those myths that people just... Uh, keep spreading? Um, at this point, there's quite a bit of anecdotal evidence. There's not as much in the evidence-based literature, although Brian Allen uh, and, and Tanya Josek had a publication on this recently. So there, Brian is a, a 
a collaborator of ours and a researcher in the entomology department where it seemed like ticks were more attracted to, I can't remember, males or females. They, they had noticed it while they were doing different experimental trials and they actually tested it. Um, but there is actually a wealth of literature on this in mosquitoes, um, indicating that absolutely hands down, yes, some people are more attractive to mosquitoes than others. Um, and it could have to do with the composition of bacteria on your skin and kind of the volatile gases that your skin gives up. So, you know, BO, right? But, but more subtle than BO, right? Um, and some people seem to have, you know, a, a more potent brew, something that's more attractive to mosquitoes, because for instance, it, maybe it indicates something about your immune system. Um, but then other really more basic things, such as when we breathe out, uh, we breathe out a, a plume of CO2. So it starts narrow here, right? And it spreads out and it's heavier than air. So it spreads down towards the ground. And so some people have a very narrow plume and some people have a very wide dispersed plume. And so a mosquito flying into that, it's gonna pick up one particle and then it'll start zipping around trying to find the next one. And that's why they end up whining in your ear because they follow that plume up. Um, and uh, it's perfectly reasonable to think that something like that could be going on with ticks as well, right? Because you think about that tick on that stalk of grass sitting there chilling, right? Maybe somebody has a heavier football than another person. Maybe they're making a heavier vibration, right? So vibration, so maybe the tick's starting to activate, right? And then somebody's got a wider CO2 plume so the tick's more likely to pick up on that, so activate further, right? And then radiant energy comes into play. And, and there could be many other things that are at play here. Volatiles, for instance, um, which we know have an impact on mosquitoes. Um, so I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that, yes, some people might encounter ticks more frequently than others, you know, in our own field crew of really seasoned tick collectors, right? So what we know essentially is that we've kind of got a very high degree of consistent behavior in tick habitats, each of us, right? We're kind of behaving the same way in every habitat. And we see consistently that some people collect more ticks than others. Um, and I, I've also suspected that, for instance, um, uh, shadow might come into play here too, because ticks have really poor vision systems. Um, some don't have eyes at all, some stages. Um, and so I've wondered if, you know, the long fall of a shadow uh, could affect, uh, you know, takes out in bright sunlight and I cast a short shadow and somebody else casts a really long one, maybe that shadow is a cue too. Maybe they're going, aha, something's blocking the sun. Something that's moving is blocking the sun. Uh, so I think that there's plenty of, um, there's, there's, there's plenty of reasons to think that, yeah, some people might be more attractive to ticks than others. Maybe just more likely to check those boxes. All right. Well, we appreciate your time, Holly. That was really interesting. I'm sure we're just scratching the surface of your tick knowledge. I'm sure this, you could talk about this for a very long time, but um, we appreciate you going through a couple of those key questions that we had for you. And um, good luck in your research and stay safe out there.